Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at deoxyribonucleic acid, better known as DNA. So when was DNA actually discovered? The story. Two men walk into the Eagle pub in Cambridge. One of them announces, we have found the secret of life. It sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it wasn't. The year was 1953, the place was Cambridge in the UK, and the people were James D. Watson of the USA and Francis Crick, who was British. You can see them pictured below. Their discovery was the double helix structure of DNA. Or was it really their discovery? The first person to photograph DNA suggesting a double helix structure was Rosalind Franklin, way back in 1951. She, with Morris Wilkins, had used the new electron microscope to produce crucial atomic level images of the structure of DNA. And so it was her work that inspired Watson and Crick to put forward the idea of a double helix structure that could unzip and replicate itself. That was how people shared genes from the parents to the child. And this was the birth of genetic medicine. So what are genetics? The animated image here shows the double helix structure of DNA. You don't need to know the atomic structure as part of your GCSEs, but you just need to know how it was useful. Inside each cell of your body, there are several identical strings of DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, but you do not need to know that. DNA is essentially a long list of instructions that operates every cell of your body. There are over 3,000 million letters of code in your body's DNA, and these have been mapped out as part of the Human Genome Project. These instructions are grouped together in genes, each with a different function, e.g. eye colour, height, if you have a disability or a disease, could also be genetic. The study of DNA and how we inherit characteristics, including sometimes illnesses, is called genetics. So how does understanding genetics in DNA help develop medicine? In other words, what's the use? Genetic medicine can be used to heat hereditary or inherited diseases which are passed from parents to children. Some of these are purely theor theoretical at the moment. We know how to do it or what needs to be done. We just don't know precisely how to actually carry out the procedures. Genetic medicine can also be used to help us understand why people become ill and to try and find solutions to this beyond understanding germs, because not all illnesses are caused by infections from germs and viruses. Every living thing, including bacteria, has DNA. Understanding how DNA works tells us how all life works. Genetic engineering of DNA can fix faults in a person's DNA, and I do use the word faults advisedly. It's more that there are particular genetic changes which might cause certain conditions. For example, it may one day be possible to engineer a diabetic person's genes to produce the insulin that they need to control their body sugars, but we can't do it yet. Special treatments can be produced that only target in spe specific types of cell within the body, such as cancer cells. And information about DNA can help scientists grow new and replacement organs that may in the future provide replacements to things like failed kidneys, hearts and other organs. Though don't be kidded if you've ever seen this particular picture before of a mouse with an ear growing on its back. No, that is not a functioning ear, but it is a demonstration of how cells can be grown in a lab in order to replace body parts. But a lot of this is still in the incredibly early stages of development. We understand a lot more than we did, but so far not a lot of it is currently applied. In 1800, much of the understanding of what the cause of illness was was still based upon the theory of the four humours, miasma and other similar theories. However, by 1953, this had improved as there was an understanding of the role of germs in causing illness and the role of DNA in passing on illnesses and diseases from one generation to another. That's a tremendous amount of progress in only 153 years. It's worth reflecting on just how much progress there had been into the modern era. Consider medieval and renaissance medical ideas. They believed in causes of disease and illness which included being sent by God, miasma or bad air, and the humours being out of balance. And so the prevention of disease and illness and the treatment of disease and illness tended to focus upon these things too. So prevention focused on prayer, cleaning the streets to get rid of miasma and the regimen sanitatis, and also things like bathing. Some of these things would have been quite helpful, other things quite useless. The treatment of disease was focused on balancing humours, prayer, transference, so in other words taking a live animal and trying to get the, the disease to transfer onto that, and herbal remedies. With the exception of herbal remedies, 
which may have been helpful at times, these things were probably more harm than good a lot of the time. So without knowing the causes of disease and illness, people struggle to find relevant preventions and relevant treatments. Compare that to modern medicine from the 20th century onwards. Today, we understand that the causes of disease and illness are bacteria, they could be genetic, and they could be related to people's lifestyle. And so prevention and treatment of disease can follow on from that. Prevention can include public health laws, sewerage, clean water, and changes to people's lifestyle. Treatments can include advanced surgery, antibiotics, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, genetic therapies, you name it. So clearly there's been a massive amount of progress. And the root of this, well, a lot of it's down to a better understanding of what actually causes illness, because when you know what you're fighting, you can be more effective in fighting it. Some final points then. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick of Cambridge University, with help from the work of Rosalind Franklin, established the structure of DNA in a double helix. This unlocked the secrets of anatomy and physiology like never before. Scientists can now understand how some illnesses are genetic in nature and inherited from one generation to another. It also unlocks possibilities for new treatments, some of which could be controversial. Understanding genetics allows an understanding of increased risks of illness in certain groups of people and how these might be managed in the future. For example, it has been revealed that there are certain genetic differences which can make some women susceptible to breast cancer. Where this is detected, they then have the option of dealing with it before it becomes something that might end up fatal. That's the end of this particular rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, please drop the video a like and subscribe to the channel. I'll be back with more soon, but for now, I'll say good health.